I'm Phil Duvall. I, I learned about Ruby's work in 1996. It was shortly after her book came out. And um, it was a quick read, and I had a huge epiphany. I had that aha moment. And I saw in a, a real flash that uh, we have been doing all of our work. I'm the director of a, or was at that time, the director of an agency that worked on chemical dependency. And uh, I realized that uh, we had based everything on an achievement-based world, where it's a middle-class way of thinking, it's the way we run our agencies. And most of the people that were coming into our agency were people that were in a relationship-based world. And boy, just making that distinction around class issues uh, was so important to me. So we uh, shared this information, uh, Terry Drusey Smith and I, she worked for me at that time. We're now both co-authors of Bridges with Ruby, and we uh, got our staff involved in these conversations and we would, you know, at the water cooler and in staff meetings and people began to get this idea and we began to make changes. The other thing we found out was about language issues and the difference between the formal register and the casual register. Uh, standard English and people who use, uh, use street language. And uh, the first thing we had to do with that information was to move our, the woman who worked at our front desk because she could not get over having that judgmental attitude towards people that didn't speak standard English. And she would give them the look. Well, in essentially insulting people within five minutes of coming into our agency. Now, I've been doing some reading outside of my field and James Champy and Peter Drucker are business writers. And they talk about doing a client life cycle. So what is the experience of your customer, of your client over, over time, but from the minute they walk in the door? And what we found was that uh, people make up their mind about your organization in their first 15 minutes, and they hold that opinion of you forever. And so we were breaking a relationship right at the beginning of our experience. So that person had to go in to do clerical work. She was a wonderful worker, but we couldn't have her insulting people in the first five minutes. Uh, the other thing we found out, uh, and this is about language too, and it's about clarifying our expectations. And at our agency, um, we use the formal register all the time, even when we didn't need to. So we're, we're doing client orientations, and we have a handbook that is 26 pages long, single-spaced. I thought it was cool because we put some cartoons in it. And I can tell you that no one ever read that. Uh, I mean, I, don't, I wrote it, so maybe I did, but outside of me, nobody read that. And of course, our clients weren't getting any kind of uh, orientation. So um, after understanding how important mental models are, how important the casual register is, you know, we want to be bilingual and speak both, uh, we made a video. And it was so simple. It was 12 minutes long, the distance between two commercials. And uh, our receptionist would, would then say, well, are you in the right place? And can we help you? Is there an emergency going on? And as soon as those things were kind of straightened out, she'd say, well, you need to know more about our agency. So here's this video. Now watch this, and then uh, if you have any questions about our organization or if you need help with the forms, you know, I'll help you with that. And that was such a respectful way that allowed us to not assume people knew how to read and write. You know, it allowed people to have a conversation with the receptionist. And uh, out of these two strategies, I can tell you that our no-show rate improved so much just by making these two simple changes. Uh, after we embedded the bridge concepts into our agency, we began to take the ideas out into the community and, and began to share the ideas that uh, Ruby had taught us. Uh, the first thing that really interested me was uh, birth to three, children have a real need for a strong language experience. And some families aren't able to get that to their kids and others are. And we wanted to address that through uh, Bridges' approaches. So we put together a collaborative, and these are people that we had trained in, in Bridges. And the collaborative was made up of people from Ohio State University, the Health Department, the Crisis Call Online Mental Health Agency, and the one that I ran. And we put together a, what we called a wellness weekend, and it was all about bringing 20 to 30 parents together at a retreat center for a weekend. And during that weekend, we would go over all the ways you can interact with your little children, uh, all kinds of role playing we did, and, and people were told on the last day you're gonna have to put on a skit, 
And they worked in family teams and they put on the funniest and the best skits and they embedded all these strategies in there. Now the OSU study on this, you know, turns out that the parents went home and were much more responsive to their kids. So it was a wonderful experience. What I liked about this was that I had found out by talking and listening to people in poverty while building, uh, getting ahead in a just getting by world, that people in poverty are problem solvers. So our design from the beginning was to have the parents invited to take over and be part of the planning. So they planned each weekend with us, and we had 13 of these weekends over a two-year period of time. By the time we got to weekend number six, we had replaced eight middle-class agency folks with six getting ahead, uh, not getting ahead, but families that had been through the Wellness Weekend with us. And we only had two agency folks there, somebody from mental health and somebody from, as a fiscal agent. And from then on, this was run entirely by the parents that had first heard the message. It showed us that people in poverty can be great problem solvers. They can be part of the solution in the community. And, uh, the, and, and of course, the schools were thrilled to have parents coming in that were doing things so differently with their kids. Another thing we did in our collaborative in our community was to get at uh, what we found out from listening to people in poverty is that they're going to three to ten organizations in order to get by and every agency they go to asks them to do an assessment and every agency has a plan for them and it's exhausting and they have to tell their story over and over. So in our community we put to together this collaborative of the TANF organization, mental health, the GED folks, uh, the uh, health department and our agency and we came together at a single location we came on Fridays and we took over this building on Friday morning and we invited people to come between 8 and 12 so there was no appointment time specifically it was just come to the Friday assessment when they got there there was food for them and there was child care provided for them and each agency had a little office in which they could meet people so they would go round robin and meet with each, each one of the agencies and fill out a short assessment. Through that mechanism, we were able to do single planning with folks and organize ourselves as the organizations so that the priorities got discussed and we were working with the clients to choose which things need to happen first, second, third. And we did it in such a way that no one was ever late. I mean, if they didn't make it one Friday, they came the next. Everything was very friendly and it was very efficient. And it gave us a chance to really practice working together and embedding something in our community that is working to this day.